The topic of today's webinar essentially is to analyze the post-pandemic future of aviation. We will talk about perspectives on the industry, on airlines, on education, on students, and on leadership principles. Let me first paint a broad canvas of some broad industry and macroeconomic trends and fundamentals in the aviation sector. And then we will hear Bill's take on these. It sounds like the tale of two cities by Charles Dickens. It's the best of times, it's the worst of times. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the ways we work, travel, and live. Amid statewide stay-at-home orders and CDC travel recommendations, it's well known that the commercial aviation industry has taken a financial hit, the biggest since 9-11. The sudden halt imposed on the aviation industry by COVID-19 crisis has hit the sector hard. In April 2020, at the peak of the pandemic, two thirds of the global aviation fleet sat idle on the tarmac, while passenger traffic was down 90% year on year. Today, the aviation industry is slowly rebounding, led by domestic travel. However, while passenger travel is roaring, the COVID-19 virus with its Delta variant is still raging. According to studies by McKinsey and Allianz, as they look beyond the pandemic, the aviation sector needs to grapple with some conundrums and some new realities and to devise strategies to adapt. I'll talk about some of them as the introduction before we start our discussion. The first is business or leisure. Will business travel or leisure travel fuel the recovery of the aviation sector? We know that pre-COVID business travel traffic amounted to $1.5 trillion per year or around 1.7% of global GDP. Business travel will take longer to recover. We estimate it will probably recover. Some industry estimates are it will recover to 80% of the pre-pandemic levels by 2024. But we also know that remote work and other flexible working arrangements are likely to stay in some form after the pandemic and people might fly less on business. However, leisure is coming back in a big way. We talk about things like revenge. A lot of leisure travel is back in the industry. The second question people are posing in the industry are about the staggering debt levels. Would that lead to financial losses, ticket price increases, and a larger role for government in the aviation sector? Many airlines have had to borrow large sums of money to stay afloat and with huge daily cash burn rates. Tapping with state-provided aid, credit lines, bond issuances, the industry has collectively amassed more than $180 billion worth of debt in 2020, a figure equivalent to more than half of the total annual revenues that year. And the debt levels are still rising. Repaying these loans is becoming even harder by worsening credit ratings and higher financing costs. The third question people are asking is, will we see a, a shakeout, a greater disparity of performance amongst airlines in the future? We know that there are two things that will hel help airlines do well. There are some airlines that boast of a higher return on invested capital, than the overall industry average of 5.8%. Those airlines have resilience. They will probably pull ahead. Not only have they been able to navigate the crisis better than their competitors, but without taking government loans and so on, it will also help them to possibly restructure to emerge with an even more competitive cost base. The other group of airlines that might do well now are the ones that have transformed their businesses through a restructuring process such as chapter 11 in the United States. Those carriers can renegotiate midlife leases, shed excess debts, and emerge leaner. They will be fierce competitors going forward. The problem, however, are those airlines that have responded to the pandemic uh, by essentially linking to state aid programs that might reduce the incentive for much needed measures such as cost organization and operational restructuring. Airlines that have not proactively transformed risk failing uh, to set the business up for longer term structural value creation. The fourth question is, is there an oversupply of aircrafts for some time to come? In the years before COVID-19, aircraft OEMs ramped up production in anticipation for continued growth. This led to a glut in aircraft availability. As we hit COVID-19, as airlines started flying less and less, there has been an excess supply of aircrafts in some parts of the world. We hear in the industry that prices for used aircraft leases have plummeted and are likely to remain lower. The monthly lease rate of a 2016 vintage Boeing 7 ER was around $1.2 million in 2019. The rate fell to less than 800,000 in 2020. New aircrafts are rumored to be available at, at deep discounts. 
On the other hand, there are parts of the world, particularly in the Asia Pacific region, where the demand for new airplanes has been growing very fast. Uh, led by emerging markets such as China, more than 75% of the new demand for aircrafts is from new aircrafts and growth rather than replacement. The fifth factor is really about air freight and logistics. Do we have a greater demand than supply for air freight and logistics transportation? And the answer is probably yes, but we will have some discussion on that. Low cargo rates was the norm over the last 10 years. Cargo has been a lifeline before COVID-19. Uh, and really before the pandemic, cargo typically made up about 12% of total revenue. That percentage tripled last year. Uh, according to the airlines estimate, only 21 down from 77 airlines around the world disclosed their operating performance, disclosing their operating performance had positive operating profits for the third quarter of 2020, typically the industry's most profitable quarter. And then there is the international demand that continues to grow, not just in the, in the area of business, but as well as leisure and cargo. As we talked about the markets in Europe and Asia Pacific, where new routes, about 1,400 new air routes have been scheduled to be added in 2021, uh, with regional airports said to be the new beneficiaries. In terms of pilot hiring, there is news in the industry that the pilot shortage is extremely serious. There is a pilot shortage that looms on the horizon. The FAA cites the airline pilot shortage as an ongoing issue. Boeing predicts that by 2039, North America will have a need for 208,000 new pilots, 192,000 new aircraft technicians, and 169,000 new cabin crew members to satisfy the industry's growing demand. The reasons for the global pilot shortage are airline pilot retirements versus pilots training to replace them and the mismatch, and increasing demand for air travel, particularly globally with record numbers of passengers. No wonder our new programs are coming at exactly the right time. In fall 2021, Marshall has launched a commercial pilot fixed wing BS program by the Federal Aviation Administration as a part 141 pilot school, uh, as well as we are pending on all, pending all required approvals, we anticipate offering an aviation maintenance AAS program in the spring of 2022. So this is a tremendously exciting situation. There are lots of positives in the air. There are lots of challenges in the air. And we have with us Bill Now today to analyze and parse these trends and the industry uh, as we hit and come out of the pandemic. Thank you, Bill, again for joining us. Let me start with our first question, which is a pretty broad question given these trends. We know that during COVID, businesses found new ways of collaborations. Video calls, Zoom calls, uh, virtual meetings have become the order of the day. Uh, however, trends in private aviation are quite different. Companies that had aircrafts continue to use them. Many of them are, are, are chartering before, did so for the first time, they did not charter before. Business travel, do you think it will be back to normal? Do you think leisure is going to drive the industry? And what about cargo? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Gilbert and Provost Mugenji. Um, it's glad to be here today. I'm very excited. And uh, with that introduction, you taught me a bunch of stuff I didn't even know uh, with all those statistics. So thank you very much. Um, to answer the question, what we saw in the aviation industry first after the first quarter of 2020 was a severe decline. That's no, you know, everybody knows that. What most people may not know is the business aviation side rebounded back fairly quick. By the third quarter, we were back to pre-2019 uh, 2019 levels, uh, almost 75 to 80%. As you mentioned, most of that was due to leisure travel. Leisure travel. And the reason was, People would travel for second homes, vacation spots uh, that they weren't feeling so much of being locked down with. The business world converted. Outside of the United States, travel was severely hampered. Uh, every country had different requirements for entry uh, based on citizenship and where you were coming in from and really restricted the international travel quite a bit. But within the US, the business aviation industry bounced back pretty quick. Um, the cargo, as you mentioned, the cargo industry really 
as most everybody knows, were ordering from Amazon, or ordering from various um, outlets to have things delivered instead of going out to shops and it has to get there one way or another. And that's transportation, whether it's uh, by air or land or sea. And um, so the cargo industry really, really felt a, a lift. Business aviation on the leisure travel, yes. Uh, the airline industry took a hit probably because people were a little apprehensive of being in big crowds and uh, the airline industry has to float with demand um, in order to maintain profitabilities or to try to achieve profitability. So, so when in business aviation, you know, we saw a pretty quick re rebound um, with the, the, Exclusion of international travel. Great. Yeah, a related issue is is this point about uh, you know there, we we keep hearing about things like there is air rage on behalf of the passengers. You know, pilots trying to come back after a long time. Uh, they, you know, the planes being in top condition as they fly back, and and the and the expenses that are incurred to bring them back into operation. What's the startup cost essentially as we come back, both in terms of labor and, and human capital, as well as in terms of uh, maintenance and, and equipment? It would, it would vary. The federal aviation regulations require a certain amount of things to be done with both airplanes and crew training in order to be put in the system. So whether the airplane's flying or whether it's sitting, there are, are regulatory requirements that have to be met to maintain those airplanes. The pilots that are coming back into the system after being off for a little while still have to go under the required training that they would have to do anyway if they were completely active. So bringing the airplanes and the flight crews back into the mix after a perceived time off or extended time off from the norm uh, is not too big of an issue other than compression. Trying to, if it comes back fast, you got to do all that at once. That causes a increase in demand for uh, folks, for maintenance technicians, as well as training people to get the planes and pilots back, which would increase a cost. But if you normalize that over the course of the years, if nothing would happen, it probably would even out as far as the cost goes, maybe even be cost beneficial on a spreadsheet as opposed to, to having a, a, a decline like we saw with the COVID. Fascinating. You know, that brings us to this question about our own aviation programs. We talked about the demand for pilots, obviously, which is going to be there and growing over time uh, and the aviation sector going globally really. The other part is the aviation maintenance program where clearly there is a demand. What was your vision for Marshall when you helped us start the aviation programs, the division of aviation, those two degrees that are, that are coming out uh, or out, and then other degrees that might come out from the business school and the College of Engineering. Uh, you know, what, what led you to think about this? Why, you know, why did you get us into this in a way, in a, in, in a great way, because we have just started this and it's looking fantastic. And how does a college degree help when it comes to pilot training? I have actually been thinking about this for Marshall since 2012, maybe even before, but I can remember 2012. Uh, the vision is, and will always be to have the, the number one most sought after aviation program in the country, both from a pilot training standpoint and a, a maintenance technician standpoint. And we're gonna do that with state-of-the-art equipment, state-of-the-art technology, uh, quality of education, experience based on our regional uh, location that you can't really get in the Floridas or Texas or the Southern um, places. And, really grow it to be the most well-recognized, well-renowned program available to up-and-coming new aviators. The aviation management side of things, I, that's what I did. 
I firmly believe that is the can only enhance your career in aviation. It broadens the horizon. The, the aviation management, you, you, as a pilot, you may find after you do that for a while, you want to do something more. Uh, me, case in point, I was a pilot and thought that's all I ever wanted to do. And the more I got involved with the business side of things, the more I liked that. And I was able to have that balance of both maintaining active um, uh, foot on the piloting side and an active um, presence on the business side. So that's what you get with the aviation management degree in the business college. It's, it's completely complementary of what you would do with just the aviation side of things. It's, it teaches you everything. It teaches you, it's all in my, my son went to college and he knew he was going to graduate and go in the Navy. And he said, what should I graduate or what should I um, major in? And I said, probably some kind of business because it's all in the numbers. No matter, no matter how you look at it, if you're in aviation, there's big cost concerns. There's big costs. You know, we have an intense focus on cost control and how do you do that and maintain or seek profitability uh, when there's a lot of um, costs associated with this industry. So the aviation management side that uh, you're going to be able to offer in the business college is a tremendous benefit for those that would think they may want to have that balance or, or switch down the road um, from being a full-time aviator. Yeah. So what you're saying, Bill, is that you know, these options, first of all, a full college degree in, 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 in flight school and pilot training is a benefit, right? Yeah. And how it fits with the other aspects of the programs. One of the things that we really are trying to put together, therefore, is an educational ecosystem where there is the pilot training program, there's the aircraft maintenance program, there is the, hopefully the aviation management program, and then something in engineering, something on the lines of aerospace engineering that might end with some technical and engineering aspects of the program. And, and again, somebody who has some experience of all of these mixing and matching, maybe a major in one of these and a minor in the other might actually benefit. Is, is, that, is that what Bill would be the way to go? In my opinion, absolutely, yes. Yeah, you, 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 can't, you can't really go wrong. Once you engulf in any industry, the more broad, the more you can broaden your horizons, the more benefit you'll have and the more success you're going to have uh, in the future. Fantastic. So we were looking at the NetJets website and you obviously, you know, as the, as the leader of the company, um, have, you know, played a huge role in their strategic development. On the NetJets website, it says that you are the first aviation, private aviation company to buy a stake in the production of sustainable aviation fuel, which is a natural and significant next step in our plans to lower our carbon footprint. Obviously, sustainability is a big issue in the world of business, and it is the future of, of, of many sectors in business, including aviation. Wanted to hear about your views on this and the issue of sustainability in the airline industry and how you became a pioneer in that field. Well, we've been concerned for many, many years in the aviation industry about reducing the carbon footprint and what we're doing to the atmosphere and, and as a whole. We have been in close um, partnerships with the aviation manufacturers, particularly the engine manufacturers, to reduce um, fuel burn. Uh, we're trying to re get, get more efficient, uh, more capable engines. Um, for many, many years. The Sustainable Aviation Fuel Initiative is really a benefit to, as you said, not only aviation, but several different industries, whether it's uh, agriculture, forestry, industry, um, any kind of transportation uh, sector. But it's, um, we all have to be cognizant and concerned with our, our world and our atmosphere. And with this initiative going forward, we thought that we should be leading the forefront of, we, we, could, we could draw a lot of attention uh, to it for um, the industry and, and the world. And it's as basically what it is, it's a, it's a bio blend of fats, greases, municipal waste into traditional aviation fuel 
that allows an offset of mixture, which you could go call it 65 to 35% mix um, to reduce those carbon emissions even more. So we, we just thought it was the right thing to do um, in general for mankind and, and the right thing to do in our, in our industry. And we latched onto it and now we've, we, it's, it's gaining a lot of ground. It's really, really going to be the way of the future. That's fantastic. I think that that attracts a lot of people to view the aviation sector in a different way. And it is certainly something that, that can grow with the times and add this element of sustainability to be more competitive. That's fantastic. Yeah. And it's not only aviation, it's going to, it's going to, all sectors. Uh, cast a big net of, of various industries. Yes, yes, yes. And having that vision early enough to be able to put the footprint makes a lot of sense. Coming to the technology side, you know, the planes that we are using in our training program for the commercial pilot fixed wing BS degree program, I was reading uses advanced avionics technology that we are probably among the first to use. Can you explain a little about how important this technology is. What do these planes come with that is so advanced and what it will mean for our students and our graduates? Sure, I think about it like if you were gonna learn a new language, but in, in the curriculum, you only learned a quarter of the language. And then when you went to the next level, you had to learn another quarter of the language and they just didn't teach you how to communicate right off the bat. That's kind of the approach we took with the technology, with the, with the equipment that we chose. This technology is truly, in these training airplanes, the very first time a flight school aviator jumps into this uh, Cirrus SR-20, they're gonna be flying more advanced technology than I currently have in the business jet that I fly all over the world. I'm not kidding you, it is that advanced. Now, the next derivative business jet that comes out will catch up and probably exceed, but you're learning the right language and the right communication skills with that, um, with those systems right off the bat. You combine that with the logistical location of the equipment in the airplane. It's just reminiscent of what you will find as you go into the bigger airplanes. We have side sticks for... Uh, flight controls, we have flight management systems that are in the middle, we have the uh, flight displays and the nav displays right in front of you all condensed into a small screen with so much information on it at your fingertips that you can select or, or decide to discard based on the uh, situation you're in is um, phenomenal. And that's one of the reasons we went to the extra expense to provide the most technologically advanced equipment out there for our um, students coming into this program at Marshall University. Not everybody has it, not everybody's gonna go to the expense to do it, but the position that our pilots and aviators and technicians will be in when they graduate, they will be suited far well beyond what the average uh, peer would be suited to go do at the next level. And it's, I'm, I'm extremely excited about it and think, as I've said before, I, I only wish we would have had this kind of technology when I was coming up because you're gonna be well suited for the next level coming out of this program. That is something which is really, really special. And I think this is something our students need to really take a note of because being able to be trained with the latest technology helps them to get into the workplace and contribute on day one. They are ready to get in there and, and, and not you know, really need a lot of training, I guess, as, as they start off with the aviation uh, FAA certification and everything else. Well, you always need the training on the specific equipment, the systems and, and that, but you will, you will know how to speak the language already, which is the, the, the part that is the, the, the big, probably one of the more challenging ones. If we, as we building block train people to put more technology, more technology, more technology, that that's a challenge. But if you think about going from minimal or a lot of technology backwards, that's even more of a challenge. So as the technology continues to grow, it's going to, um, you're going to be speaking the same language and be able to not, you'll be looking at any flight deck 
when you get on an airline or a business jet, you're going to understand what that's telling you, as opposed to the layman that just looks up into the flight deck and goes, that looks so complicated. I don't even know what I'm looking at. It's all about preparedness. That's fantastic. Yeah. You know, when I see your background, I see this, this beautiful whiteboard where you have some things written on leadership. It appears to me it's not, I can't read it all, but I wanted to ask something about leadership, but is that something about leadership that you had on there? It actually is. I was just having a meeting. Sorry about that. I should have erased it. Um, awesome. I was just having a meeting with uh, some of the executives here. I'm in one of my offices and we were talking about leadership and, and what that means and how is it, are you born with it? Is it trained? Is it a combination of both? Can it be taught? Um, and how is it reinforced? And I think that if to be successful and to be viewed as a, a, a positive influence in any setting, whether it's sports, business, um, classroom, doesn't matter. Any, 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 any setting that you are a focal point in, and that can be amongst yourselves as well. You don't have to hold a, a position, um, so to speak. The matter of fact, what I find is some of the more, more better leaders are embedded into the teams and not necessarily those that help hold fancy titles. But it, in a nutshell, I was asked, Bill, how would you define leadership if you could only use one word? You ever thought about that question? So that's what started this. I said, well, I said that what I would have to kind of lean towards is leadership in one word, support. That's for me. That's not right or wrong. That's just a style. Said another way, a servant type approach to, to leadership. Um, and I think a lot of times where the business college really can influence future leaders is an education on leadership. A lot, a lot of businesses and teams miss a great opportunity where we have people that, that get hired into a business. They do a really, really, really great job. So because they did a great job, we promote them into another position, but we give them no training, no tools, no expectations of what that means. Now, leadership comes with great sacrifice and great responsibility. And it's not about, leadership is not about being in charge. It's about taking care, taking care of those that are in our charge. And I think that a lot of businesses miss that, um, that opportunity a lot. So but behind me at the top, I don't know. Can you see that at all on the screen? A little bit. No, not very clearly, but. At the top, it says safety and then yes. followed by service. Safety, keep our people safe. What does that mean? It could mean industry specific, job specific. It could mean uh, weather. It could mean um, uh, disease, uh, viruses, keep our people safe, keep each other safe, take care of one another, look out for one another. Service, what a lot of people would say, well, if you're in a service business, it's to serve your customer. What I would say is to be successful at serving your customer, you have to serve one another first from the nucleus of the business or the company or the corporate headquarters, and then have that permeate out into the people that actually deliver the service to your customers. Because if you don't do that, you, you will miss that, that cultural influence. The next thing, it says culture, people, numbers. My approach has always been culture trump just about everything. If you don't get the culture right, you're fighting up uh, against the current people. Take care of your people, get the right people, 
pay attention to the hiring process, pay attention to the nurturing process, pay attention to the growth process, invest in your people. And then numbers a lot of times take care of themselves. What I see a lot of businesses and people do is shoot for the numbers first for quarterly earnings, for annual earnings, you know, growth um, and kind of squash culture and people. And you may be successful in the short term doing that, but you're not going to be successful in the long term if you're playing the long game in any business, which businesses are in it to win. But if you really think about it, there's not too many businesses that are in it to complete, to, to finish. <laughs> it's yeah. a it's a long game. You want to play the game to keep playing the game, not to have an end like a, a sporting event where you, the clock runs out. Not too many businesses are like that, but a lot of times, if you concentrate on the numbers only, that's what you tend to believe you're 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 playing. Below that's a philosophical approach to leadership to to build teams. Is I always try to be honest, fair, and consistent, and that by definition, will result in respect, trust, and ultimately loyalty. If you have a team, a, a business, a, a group that is loyal to one another, um, you got a really good chance of, of winning um, the, the, the goals you're setting forth for, for the team. Below that is a uh, upside-down organizational chart with me at the bottom. I believe if you support the people that support the people that support the people that ultimately deliver the service to your customers, you will win on a consistent basis. And that goes back to the supportive servant type leadership. doesn't mean you don't have to make hard decisions and make difficult calls, um, but that's part of life in general, uh, certainly in business or uh, any team. But that general approach tends to be very successful. And then at the bottom is says uh, have an intense focus on cost control, not to the detriment of safety and service, but an intense focus on cost control. I always like to say, show me the pennies, they lead to the millions. A lot of folks go for the big numbers and the big deviations on a chart and, you know, what swung that, how come that that went down 35%. And I say, yep, we need to, we need to look at that stuff, but also we need to show where the little ones are too, because uh, they tend to lead to the big ones. So that's what's behind me. Thanks for noticing. Sorry that I didn't have that read. This is, this is fascinating. You know, what you were talking about, this, this idea, this, this is, this the insights about leadership is truly valuable to anyone in business in any sector, including aviation. This is truly remarkable. In fact, you know, it makes me think, I was reading recently a book by uh, D. Hawk, who's the founder and former CEO of Visa Credit Cards, uh, very famous visionary CEO. And, you know, one of the things he said is control is not leadership. Management is not leadership. And then he says leadership is leadership and culture. It's really promoting that culture. I think that's exactly what he said. Uh, he says, if you seek to lead, invest some of your time, a significant amount of time in leading yourself, your own purpose, ethics, principles, motivation, conduct, another percentage of your time leading and working and serving your people that, that work with you in your teams, invest another 20% or so leading with authority over you, people leading with authority over you, and another 15% or so leading your peers. And essentially, it's like a 360 degree starting with self-leadership and then you know, building the culture through team spirit, like you said, and then basically supporting others to perform their duties and succeed. I think that's truly insightful. And, and that is exactly what it takes to succeed um, in, in the world of business because you are everybody is going towards the same goal and, and having everyone on that team and work together uh, with their different roles. But in the same team is probably the best way. The team of teams, as we can call it, is really, um, is really the great way. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I, you know, you would hope that everybody's moving towards the same goal, but sometimes that takes a lot of time, energy, and effort to uh, maintain that culmination of direction. You know, if you go into a bookstore, you see a, a lot of sections say self-help, right? You never see a section that says help others. <laughs> uh, maybe we should, you know, have that as well because it's not only self-reflection, but it's also invest in time into the team and each team member. When I come into my office, whichever location I'm at, it, it normally takes me about an hour and a half to get from my front, the front door to my actual office door because 
I spend the majority of the morning going around and just checking in and saying hi and getting to know the various members of the team um, and see what's what's going on. As a matter of fact, this morning I found that one of our team members uh, wasn't in today um, because they had an issue with an illness with a child. I would have not known that if I hadn't been walking around this morning. So I send them a message. Understand there's, you know, concern. If you need anything at all, please don't hesitate to let me know. Um, whatever you need, let us know when you, you know, when you're ready to, to come back. Don't worry about a thing. We got you. And I think that's incredibly important when you're looking for confidence, trust, and loyalty um, because you spend a lot of time with your team. It's if, – if all you're worried about is control, results, um, you're, 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 you're going to have a not as a successful team as if you spend a lot of time worrying about the individuals um, on an individual basis uh, as well and arguably spend more time on that than, than the other stuff because your, your team – ultimately produces, right. you know, what CEO stand for. There's been many um, ways to fill in the letters of the acronym, but chief, chief energy officer, chief empathy officer, <laughs> that, um, that kind of thing is, a, you know, kind of like a head coach. You, you gotta, you gotta truly be authentic. And, and if, if you, if you, if you lack authenticity and you try to fake it, it won't work. But if you're if you're truly in a leadership position, whether you're embedded in the teams at a supervisory level, at an elevated level, um, that true authentic authenticity of uh, caring about one another, watching each other's backs, um, is critically important for for the team's success. And um, yeah, I think that. Um, any team could be that I would say combined with work ethic, you know, work, work ethic is, which I was fortunate enough to learn from my mother and father. Uh, my dad would leave on a Monday and come back on a Friday and my mom would leave at four o'clock in the morning, go to the hospital and be back at six o'clock at night. And I learned from an early age by default, uh, work ethic, uh, this, this morning, I was in the office at 620. Um, in this office, the lights actually come on at 7 o'clock. <laughs> um, but and, and not by any means. And everybody, all, everybody on the team knows I don't expect them to be here at all before the, if they need to be here. If you need to be in the office, come in the office. If you don't need to be in the office, don't be in the office. I'm much more concerned with uh, quality over quantity any day of the week. So work ethic is big for me. And what I've found is um, work, work ethic eliminates fears. If, if I have something that's bothering me or something that's uh, worrying me, I, that's upcoming, uh, my signal to myself is to dig in and, and learn everything I can possibly learn about it. And, and then the fears just, just, or the anxiety just goes away of any apprehension I may have on any subject. Or, or situation. That's wonderful. I'll ask you one more question and then we will open up the questions from the audience uh, because we will uh, end the hour. My last question is about mentorship. You know, aviation airline industry is a fairly, is, is, is a very high end profession. It is, it is something which is very, you know, very specific in terms of the skills required. Um, what is the role of mentors for our students, for example, starting our program, pursuing a career in aviation, and how did a mentor help you as you grew through the ranks of mentors? That's a, that's a great question. I um, can tell you that I have been in times in my career where I was feeling a little lost, uh, didn't really, you know, needed ideas uh, to, to, to launch, a, in a new direction or, or grow in a, in a position. And I mentioned my mom and dad had a lot of influence on my work ethic. I'm sure I could name several uh, 
leaders or people that I respected along the way that also had an influence on my work ethic. I got a lot of uh, benefit from reading books. Uh, when I found myself in a position where I was kind of a little bit lost and didn't really have a direction, I would go and I would ask folks, you know, what books are you reading? What, you know, how, how you know, they, give me, give me some good ideas. And I've got a, I've built up over the years, a incredibly large library of uh, various books. Uh, I, I like to read um, uh, a lot of autobiographies or biographies on people you hear from their words, you know, what worked for them, what um, a lot of philosophical books, a lot of psych psychology. Actually, somebody asked me one time, they said, what is it you do all day? And I said, pretty simple, psychology and law. And they said, well, you've got 900 airplanes going all over the world. I said, no, that, that's easy. It's, it's the psychology um, and philosophical approach to things, as well as, um, of course, you know, in business, you got to deal with some of the, the legal matters as well. But it's, um, and, and I could name several folks of influence that uh, you probably would not recognize uh, if I name their names uh, they're not celebrity type status people but there's not too many people I've ever come to today I've learned things from people um, there's not too many people I come in contact with that I'm not trying to gain some kind of insight from or because I the way I look at it I, I need all the help I can get so I, I'm I'm trying to, to learn something from anybody I interact with that's awesome we have about 10 minutes remaining, and I, I'll hand this back to Dr. Nancy Langton uh, to moderate the Q&A session. We might have received some questions before or, or anything may come in. So if you have a question, anyone, please send it to chat. Nancy. Okay. Uh, thank you, Avi and Bill, for an enthusiastic, informative, and insightful presentation today. It will help us all think more about the challenges in the airline industry and opportunities facing the aviation industry and how Marshall's new programs can help students navigate this path. I'll now read some of the questions that were posted in the chat function during the event and some questions we received before the event. All right, the first question on the agenda is about that how you started out as a flight instructor and became chief operating officer of NetJets. Uh, the person asking the question wants to know if you experienced any challenges in your climb to a top executive position, and if so, how did you deal with them? Wow, yes, many, many challenges at every turn. Uh, it seemed like nothing that was um, not overcome, but some met with more challenges than others. So as a flight instructor, I started as a pilot in, in West Virginia, uh, decided that's what I wanted to do, uh, the way to build time. I started learning uh, how to teach people to fly. And that was really beneficial because it, the area I was doing that in had a lot of uh, various um, cultural um, variety. Uh, different people from different com countries, different languages. Uh, you try to teach somebody how to fly in a world that they're unaccustomed to and then put a language barrier in there. When I look back, what it really taught me to do was try to figure out ways to explain things differently, explain the same thing differently to a multitude of people so they can understand it. I've seen a lot of people, if you explain something to somebody and they don't get it and you explain it again, they don't get it. You explain it again, but now you're doing it in a louder voice. Well, the volume doesn't help somebody explain something any better. You've got to change your approach and adapt to the situation. So that at an early part in my aviation career really taught me a lot of lessons on how to communicate, how to communicate with groups. Everybody here knows that if you're if you have an instructor standing in front of you and describe something, some people get it completely crystal clear, some people may not, and there's various in between. So how does the teacher, the instructor, the professor, the, 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 the leader make sure that there's, there's good continuity between all participants on a level of understanding of the subject matter? 
the challenges, of course, were met. We, we, when I came into NetJets, I came in as a pilot and kept telling the management people, I've got this idea, I've got this idea, and I've got this idea. And finally, they got sick of listening to me, and they said, can you come in and help us run the business? Well, when I got hired, we had 17 airplanes. Within a period of about seven years, we had over 600 airplanes. So the growth was vertical. And you talk about making some mistakes along the way and having challenges along the way. At every turn, we had them. And we were, we were um, the team really came together because we were all in it together and we needed one another. We really, really needed to lean on one another to, to make it. And um, that, was, uh, that was very exciting, but extraordinarily challenging. Okay, thank you. We have uh, another question from the audience. What values or experiences did you derive from growing up in West Virginia that you feel helped you differentiate yourself and excel in the global business world? Uh, that's a great question. I'm so proud to be from West Virginia. It, it never fails that in some setting somewhere, uh, it comes up. And I tell you what, I, I, people have told me, I just boost with, with pride when it, when it, when it comes, uh, when it comes up core values growing up in West Virginia. Are you kidding? Core values, the, the integrity character that was instilled in, upon us to be honest, act with impeccable character and with the utmost integrity the story I tell people time and time again, if you're in West Virginia and you're driving down the road and you have a car issue, the person behind you may not stop, but the person behind them will just to help you. And that's what it's all about, helping, supporting uh, one another and working hard. You know, I hear a lot of people say, nobody can outwork me. And I always kind of roll my eyes and go, oh, yeah, I, I, I'll take that challenge. <laughs> Great. We have another question, and it also has to do with some of the things you did early in life. The question is, you mentioned sports, and we know you are an accomplished swimmer. How do sports help you be a great pilot and a great leader? Well, these are great questions. I, I make a lot of analogies between business and sports uh, philosophies on how to, how to approach team unity and team success. They're very similar in my opinion. Uh, coaches would make good CEOs. Good CEOs could make good coaches. Very, very similar. The, I will tell you this, when I'm in a board meeting with various leaders in different industries and you talk a little bit and get to know one another, there's there's a lot of business executives, a lot of uh, leaders in the industry that have a background in athletics. And what does that teach you? Well, it, it teaches you everything you need to know to be successful in business. It te teaches your work ethic, keep to a, to a schedule, goal setting, um, team unity. How do you get along with, with the team? How do you get along with the coaches? How do you take direction from coaches and assistant coaches and then interpolate that back into how do you give direction? Is it authoritative? Is it dictatorial? Or is it in a, in a more softer setting? Um, there's places for both. But the, the sporting uh, experience with, uh, that I had growing up did nothing but I, I don't think I would, um, I, I don't think I'd be here talking to you today probably without my athletic uh, background. Great, thank you. Looks like we have time for one more question, maybe two, we'll see. Uh, the question from the audience is, if you could offer current students one piece of advice that will help them achieve your, their aspirations, what would it be? I would say enter into a field that you have an innate love for. If it starts off with, hey, this is kind of cool and I, I may be interested, if that develops into an internal 
flame, a, a, something, a desire that is hard to stop thinking about, hard to stop pursuing, um, find that, whether it's aviation or, or anything else. Because the old adage, if you find a hobby you can make a living at, you're never going to work a day in your life. Well, I've worked pretty hard and had some pretty long days in my life as a professional. But at the end of the day, it's a smile. And it's like, this is, they, they pay us to do this. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a privilege and um, a thrill to, to do that. And it, that will offer you true fulfillment in your, in your life, not only your career, but your life. And it won't be viewed as a job from, from your own perspective. You know, I got to go to work or I got to go to do my job. It will feel more like I get to go do this again today. And you'll wake up energized and you'll have a, a, you have a and that'll translate over to your friends, to your family, to your kids, to your pets. It will make all the difference in the world if you can find that, that, that true inner flame, passion, desire, whatever you want to call it. And just pursue it. And don't let anybody or anything stop. Just fail. If you try it and you fail at something, so what? Who cares? Everybody does that. I failed three times a day already at something. I, I just keep what is the old Michael Jordan? He missed 9,000 of the shots he took for crying out loud. He didn't win every single championship he played it. He's the best ever. Well, don't be afraid of that. Just go for it, deal with it, learn from it. And, and move forward. And you'll have a, a wonderfully um, successful, incredible, fulfilling life as a career and a, as an individual. Well, thank you uh, very much. Wonderful <laughs> insights. I just wanted to say, Bill, thank you very, very much again. Before I turn it back to Nancy, we are getting some great feedback from the audience on our, on our messages and on the chats. Uh, thank you for these inspiring words. You inspire us every day. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and you know, I just want to wish everyone a great academic year. Uh, truly appreciate you being here. We will have the video available for distribution. So if anyone wants to film video, please reach out to us. Back to you, Nancy. Okay, great. This wraps it up for our first Herd Insight Small Business Webinar of the academic year. Can we I say one more thing, Nancy? Sure. I, this is the fastest hour I've ever had in my, in, in my recent memory, <laughs> I, I tell you. I could go for another hour with you guys easy if you'd like, but uh, anytime, <laughs> you guys, thank you thank very you. much. Thank, thank you. It's really been a great start to a Monday and an academic year. Very, very inspiring for all of us. Um, just our normal closing, we want to announce our next webinar that will be in three weeks on September 13th, featuring our faculty member Mark Solacy and business professional Don Williams. Look for your res registration email to arrive shortly. Please share the email invite with anyone you know who might benefit from this event. We appreciate your participation and always remember, we are Marshall. <laughs>